Well, I think we can get started. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, I want to talk a little about, uh, about what we call the yoga. Uh, start out with a little bit about my background and, and uh, talk a little bit about why a number of us think IoT gateways are actually pretty important in, in the IoT architecture. And we'll see if, uh, see if you guys agree. And then, you know, really, VMware and IoT, what's all that about? Huh? So I'll try to clear that up. Why we're here, why we're interested in IoT, and kind of what our thinking about it is uh, going forward. But then really concentrate uh, the, the bulk of the talk on Leota, uh, what it is. We had a hackathon yesterday. Um, and, and that environment's still up, so if anybody's interested after this talk, uh, come and see me. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you one of the VMs and, and you can go through the course syllabus. We won't be able to do everything because we had an actual robot there yesterday that uh, the guys uh, had to program with. And, uh, but you can do most of it if you want to learn a little bit about the other. And then, and then show you some end-to-end -end -end open examples. So, uh, using Leota, and then also some examples using uh, commercial platforms on the, on the cloud side. So this is what we kind of see the architecture uh, ending up in the next five years or so. There's, there's going to be a, num a number of devices that connect uh, directly to the data center side or the cloud. You know, I kind of use data center, cloud, uh, server to mean the other side, right? Whether that's on-prem solution, the private hosted cloud, VPN into something or another, uh, corporate cloud, uh, cloud at, at your home. Uh, I don't differentiate between those. So for the rest of the talk, that's just sort of the, the cloud side. And then, of course, in our case, our customers really want the results of IoT to connect into their business apps because modifying or changing how their business apps receive input and behave, that's where they get value for the company. And so in the enterprise world, sort of the, the right-hand side of the cloud is, is why they want to do this. And we're kind of interested more from uh, cloud side out the devices. Uh, I started looking at, at IoT back in the late 90s. My sort of my background is real-time scheduling theory. Uh, I worked at first IBM and then at Sun doing the real-time Java specification and implementing that with the team. And. Uh, so, so I've spent like the better part of a decade hanging out in the embedded community, uh, new to the open source community. So Leota is sort of my first project that I've kind of open source, and so that that's uh, that's why we're here, and uh, it it'll, it'll be a new experience for us. But I do understand the embedded space uh, pretty well. And one of the things about the, there's a number of things about the embedded space that are very different from the enterprise space. And tell me if I'm preaching to the choir here, but because of the work I did in my graduate work and the work around real-time Java, uh, I've always sat professionally sort of right at the intersection of those two worlds, right? On one side, Java was enterprise Java, right? That's what the big uh, companies use now to implement their databases and web services and everything in JavaScript there. Real-time Java was about the embedded side of the world. And so in a single VM, we had this clash of worlds between enterprise and embed. And it, even my graduate work is in this area. So I've had kind of a long history, actually, my whole professional career in computer science has been sitting right on that boundary. And so IoT is, is, a, is a natural place for me to end up, uh, because IoT is a lot about the connection, in some ways, of those two uh, different disciplines. 
And I look at the IoT gateways as, as sort of a decoupling point rather than a connector. So a lot of people call them the connectors between the two worlds. And given my understanding and the, the, the differences among those worlds, I don't, I don't think we actually want to connect them. I want to think we want to keep them separate. And the IoT gateway, I think, does that for us because we can isolate all the differences of the industrial automation, thing world, embedded side on the left side of the IoT gateway. And on the right side of the IoT gateway, it can behave like any of our systems connected to the internet, the enterprise, the web, whatever you have on that side. Another characteristic of the uh, embedded space is the, the, the large heterogeneity of devices, communications protocols, uh, security issues, physical issues, compared to our side of the world. So we kind of have more or less one layer four protocol for pretty much everything we do. Most of their stuff on their side doesn't even get up to layer four. Uh, pretty much think of it as IP, a lot of it is serial. Uh, certainly not wide area. So that's a, that's a difference, and, and the gateways help us bridge that, or keep them separate, really, keep couple the, the differences. And, and a couple reasons we want to do this is that... They didn't seem complaining. Any change you start over? Expected lifetime, that's, that's sort of a, a big thing. If, if you buy one of these devices and uh, your, your refrigerator, you expect to keep it for a while. I don't expect to buy a new refrigerator as often as I buy one of these. Maybe I buy these too often, but uh, I want it to last a decade and a half, two decades. And the question then is, if that thing's connected with the layer four connection through the public internet to something, is the manufacturer of the device going to keep the software on that endpoint at the level of best practices that exist on the internet for 20 years? That's the real question. Can we, can we rely on that? If they don't, that layer four connection degrades. And that connection becomes vulnerable from anywhere in the world. So that's where the security aspect comes in. I work uh, at, at VMware. We're really lucky to be right next to the Stanford campus. And we work with a group there called the Secure Internet of Things Project. And it's run by a bunch of professors who, like me, started way back when the, almost when the internet started and who were firm believers in the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge, under, or the peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer convention of the internet, right? Two machines got to talk to one another over this thing we called the internet. And that sort of degraded it a bit. We got client-server, and then we got sort of the big players coming in. And, and over time, that notion has, has drifted away a bit. But fundamental in that notion is the idea that a middle box, what we call them, routers, uh, gateways, switches, they don't get to mess around with even layer four data, 
right? Anything underneath layer four, that's fine. But layer four and above, that was the endpoint to endpoint uh, configuration, or the endpoint to endpoint conversation. Well, these professors there, also our chief research officer at VMware, Dave Tenenhaus, who has a long history at um, pretty, pretty impressive institutions, uh, including DARPA as a program manager, and myself have convinced ourselves that IoT gateways will be the first time that we have a middle box that gets to fool around with all of the layers, all the way up to seven. And that's the, that's the, that's how you look, that's how you discover is something in IoT gateway. Is there, is there a need for, for changing the conversation completely, terminating the endpoints in the gateway on either side? In some cases it's, cases, it's obvious, right? I mean, if you have an IoT gateway function in an automobile, you're not going to have the brake sensor with its own TCP stack communicating directly over cellular uh, to some data center. It just doesn't make sense. And so it talks CAN bus like it, like it normally does. There's IoT gateway function on the vehicle. Uh, to, to do the conversion of all the layers and, and talk to the data center. At the enterprise level, thinking about the security issue is very critical. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that more later. So right now, in, in our view of the world, I just want to uh, differentiate between what we call infrastructure telemetry and content telemetry. And there's an example there with, with uh, transportation. So content telemetry is the telemetry of the data that everybody in IRT is talking about, where most of the value is going to be derived, where all the excitement is. And for corporations, most of the revenue is going to come from analyzing that data. That's not where VMware sits. We sit squarely on the infrastructure side. So we want to collect telemetry from the IoT infrastructure, from the devices and the IoT gateways that make up that infrastructure, and keep track of their operational status. If you think about what VMware does in the data center, of course, there's vSphere, vCenter, vSAN, NSX. But we also have a suite of management tools that manages all those pieces in the data center. We're extending that notion out to the IoT infrastructure. So, so that's where we want to sit. And uh, you know, to do this, you need basically the same kind of things you need in a data center. You need to get telemetry from all those things uh, that inform you what their operational status is. You need to be able to push control back out to them. Uh, you need to have some sort of alerting mechanism. You have to be able to change the configuration and manage the application lifecycle on all those uh, endpoints that, that you manage. The, the trouble is that at the, at the enterprise level, this really comes in and and is causing our customers to think, uh, think about how they're going to approach IoT. So our customers are the CIOs and their staff of about 80% of the Fortune 1000 companies. And pretty much 80% of the data centers in the world run on, on our stack. And so our customers are coming to us and say, look, there's this, uh, a lot of this IoT stuff out there. It looks pretty interesting. Companies are trying to install these things they call IoT gateways all around our enterprise. They come from different manufacturers. They come from manufacturers uh, that we've never heard of. Uh, they they want to stream data outside our enterprise without us giving any control or understanding of where that data is going. And, and we need help from you, who have been our strategic partners, 
uh, in this whole infrastructure thing uh, to help us look at how to get a handle on, on this complexity coming our way. So what we're trying to do is build a management suite uh, that, uh, yeah, so this doesn't always work. Let me just try this. So we, we're going to build, we're trying to build a management tool to manage all of your IoT infrastructure and enterprise. And that, that's independent sort of, of where the gateways come from, who does the content analytics, uh, where the gateways are placed. So we want to we wanna be able to give our customers the op opportunity of managing that with a single tool. Because they're saying, look, if, if I deploy this gateway from company X, they have a kind of a management solution for their gateways. And company Y has a management solution. And there's these small IoT companies with solutions that think, we think have some value, but they are kind of using some hacked together gateway we've never heard of before, and they want to stick it on our walls. And so our idea, and this is just a, a mock-up, the actual the version of this tool we have actually running and that we used in the hackathon yesterday uh, is, is uh, not as pretty as this. But basically the idea is all the IoT gateways and, and edge systems in your enterprise, you know, here's the number you're managing. 200 are edge systems, 800 are IoT uh, devices attached to those. You can look at the alerting status, uh, you can then move to uh, a part of the tool where you can control the application lifecycle on all those pieces. So enough of that. That's our, that's our story. Uh, we're sticking to it. And I'll show you a little bit. We'll get to, get to Leota really quickly. I'll show you a little bit of what we did at uh, VM world. I have to get out of this again. So along these lines. So at VM world, we had eight, uh, seven different IoT solutions. Uh, each with a different kind of IoT gateway. So this first one was two industrial cranes with, this is kind of fuzzy, uh, embedded PCs by a company called SK Solutions. Uh, SAP was doing the, ma the content side management for those cranes. We were managing the gateways. Here's the robot we had at the hackathon yesterday. Uh, Thingworks was doing the content analytics. Dell IoT gateway, we were managing that gateway. Here's a smart building, that's an Intel gateway, again same story. Video surveillance unit, Leota's running as our agent on that. Leota's running on all of these IoT gateways. Uh, uh, they're doing the content man um, analytics for that, which is uh, facial uh, recognition and gunshot detection. There's a, a head unit from a car that's under our management. Again, pillboxes from Deloitte and a Coke machine. So the message at, at VMworld was, OK, very different IoT solutions. Uh, but. This is just uh, all managed by Project I. So, so this is how the uh, API looks today. And we can actually push fixes down to that red gateway. And then the gateway turns green because we fixed the bug. All right, now. So that's, that's, so that's kind of what VMware, um, you know, our idea, my idea of why IoT gateways are important. 
and uh, how VMware is, is looking to play. Now, for the, for the open part, the little IoT agent, Leota. So what we really wanted was some sort of a framework in which we could build a portable, modular, easy to deploy uh, framework for IoT gateways that we could, we could get on any IoT gateway in the world. Even if, the, even if the vendor of the IoT gateway wasn't so interested in working with us, like maybe had their own tool and, and said, no, we don't want to use your tool. Uh, so we wrote it in Python, and we're making it open source. And we're, we're at the early stage, just beginning to reach out to the community. We did the hackathon here. We'll, we'll probably do the hackathon again in February in Portland. So we were late getting on the schedule here. But hopefully we'll, we'll do it again, so look out for us. Uh, it's a BSD2 clause license, which is the most liberal license my lawyers tell me you can do in open source. So like, do anything you want with it, just keep the headers there. Don't put anything back, put proprietary stuff in and ship it. You know, we don't care. Uh, and we have, like I said, we haven't found an IoT gateway in which this won't work. And, and really, why we're doing it, why we will take a community version into what we call Project ICE right now, this management tool, is uh, exactly that. We want to in, be independent of content analytic, gateway vendor, or where this is in the organization. Is it in a factory? Is it in real estate? Is it in office buildings? Is it in warehouses? Is it on vehicles or trucks? You know. Okay, so the, the high-level design, we sort of abstract the problem into six uh, major abstract classes. Uh, device represents uh, some sort of a data source connected to an IoT gateway or, or the edge system. So you'll hear me say IoT gateway, edge system, those are like the same. Uh, Uh, device could be on the edge system itself. So in a bunch of our examples, we use RAM memory as a device. So we just create a device representing RAM memory and, and flow metrics back, back about that. Uh, but, but it could be any, any data source, basically. Device comms are an abstraction for the communication mechanism between a device and a gateway. And those come in, in all kinds of flavors. Like I said, CAN bus, Modbus, Ethernet, EtherCAT, uh, wireless IO protocol, or wireless protocols for uh, the factory, real-time wireless protocols, real-time heart, uh, all over the map on that side of the world. For the home, it's Zigbee and Z-Wave. An edge system, that's the entity that represents the edge system itself. A metric is an entity representing a streams of number, comma, timestamp tuples. So that's the fundamental thing uh, we, we do with uh, Leota, is create sort of a pipeline uh, to get this, this stream of tuples back to uh, a data center component. And that's what we call our abstraction for the th whatever it is on the data center side that's ingesting this stream of numbers. We call them DCCs, data center components. And a package manager. A package manager is, uh, allows you to load and unload Leota packages. I'll talk more about um, the package manager in detail later. Before we get to that, though, here's, a, here's what I spent some time trying to manhandle PowerPoint into doing what I wanted to do yesterday. I really don't like PowerPoint. And uh, to do an animation like this means I, I cared about doing something for you guys so you would understand it. So first you have to sort of pick of those we have an abstract class entity, a subclass of that uh, edge system, and then some concrete implementations of that. 
like the Dell Edge 5000, the DK300, uh, the Intwine, and so forth. So you instantiate one of those uh, gateway objects or build your own. Do the same thing for a device. Same thing for a communication mechanism. Create a metric. Metrics don't have flavors until you uh, create one, and, and I'll go into how, how you do that a little bit later. And you pick a data center component that you want to work with, a communication mechanism for that, and some sort of cloud piece to talk to. So these are more or less pluggable uh, and somewhat dynamic. Now, um, in, in the talk today, and, and if you've used Node-RED, you know, you use Node-RED to wire things together. This isn't wiring. This is just PowerPoint. This is just explaining to you what you do in code. I've never been big on graphics for coding. Uh, I always find it too limiting, so I just would rather write code, but that's just me. So some comments on that. So the, the device and DCC comms are not necessarily a, a pub-sub mechanism. So the way that you, you people tend to like to do things like that is, is have sort of a message bus. Uh, Wind River IDE, IDE has MRAA uh, and DBUS. Uh, you can also use sort of MQTT and other messaging protocols sort of between devices and, and the edge system and the edge system and uh, the data center. I'm not, uh, some of that's okay, but as I mentioned, you know, my, my history is, is way back when I started learning about all this stuff in the 90s. So I'm kind of a, I tend to like more tightly bound communication mechanisms. So I like to open a socket to somewhere and then just have it. I really don't like HTTP-based REST uh, communications for data flow. It's OK for management. It's nice. But for flowing data, uh, I don't like the whole idea of stateless. There's, there's too much about data flows that you should know about the flow uh, called metadata that, that you don't want to flow every time. And a lot of the solutions I've seen that don't consider this, uh, that they just want to use REST-based protocols, uh, have to flow that metadata every time. And that metadata can get pretty big. We, uh, in the early days, we used a, a, you know, a temperature sensor, a thermistor. We went to Mauser and got an LM35 uh, thermistor. It's just you know three wires, a small chunk of pl plastic signal power and ground, and you know, it's data sheet, literally, not kidding, it's data sheet is 30 pages long. And that specifies how this little chunk of plastic behaves in every conceivable situation. That data sheet is the metadata that belongs with the stream of temperatures that come off that temperature sensor. If you do want to do serious analytics, on something where that temperature sensor is being used to measure the temperature, you may need to know a lot of the stuff that's in that 35 page, 30 page data sheet. Like what, is the, what are the error bounds under these particular conditions uh, under this, this source voltage? Well, if you're NAST and you're measuring temperature in homes, you don't care. If that temperature sensor is in the reaction uh, vessel of some big chemical plant, it's in a rocket motor, and you're doing analytics on it, you better know what the error bounds are. Because if you don't, uh, you're not going to get the right answer. So things like that, I feel you know, we really need a way to, to take that metadata and move it to the data center component one time and not keep flowing it. So that's, that's the idea of that these entities register with the data center component in, in our model. It may or may not actually cause a flow. Graphite 
doesn't use registration. Um, our project ICE does, ThingWorks does. Uh, I don't think IBM does now. You sort of pre-register, pre-create the device in Bluemix and, and then go. But our model is that the gateway should do everything. You should never have to do any punching buttons on a GUI uh, to get ready to send device. So metrics, uh, there's uh, no problem sending the same metric to multiple DCCs. You can register it with multiple DCCs. You get back a registered object. And uh, the registered object then is, is what participates in the, in the framework. And we'll get to that in a minute. So again, devices and edge systems, you can register them with multiple data center. And by and large, device and edge systems now are placeholders. We don't have much in them. The hope is that over time, we'll understand as, as we experiment with more of these and more of these uh, get into the repo, we can do some refactorings periodically and move commonalities up into the abstraction and then create concrete representations and put idiosyncrasies in there. Now, they, how do we get data? So this is a little controversial, but given my history in, in the embedded space, uh, I didn't think I could do a credible job of abstracting every device in the IoT space with some simple API that me and my team would dream up overnight. So for now, we sort of punted on that, and we left it completely open. And the way we do this is we, we have these things called user-defined methods, or UDMs, and I'll go into sort of detail about uh, how, those, how those work later. So uh, again, registration was um, you, you create an entity and register with a data center component. It's at that time that the data center component can uh, associate some metadata with that entity, either, either with a stream of numbers or with uh, uh, one, the gateway or, or device. So the package manager is, is a lot like OSGI bundles. Uh, in fact, frighteningly so. So the intern and I that, that developed it last summer, the package manager, we were thinking, well, this sounds kind of cool. Do you think we should patent it? So we started looking around for other stuff. And in the back of my mind, I had these OSGI bundles. So we went through that, and we said, no, actually, we just rewrote OSGI bundles for Python is, is what we did. And, and so that's the idea. Leota package has a list of names of other packages that uh, should be loaded before this, so it depends on these packages, so it's a dependency list. Uh, a run method that gets called when you load it, a cleanup method that gets called when you unload it, and a way to get access to uh, other objects that have been created that it needs, a registry. So a registry is passed into the run method, other packages will put representations of themselves or other objects into that registry, and any package can pull whatever it needs out uh, to operate. So user-defined methods. So this is the way we, we get to devices right now. And <laughs> If we're going to, if, we're, if we want to flow the CPU utilization of one of these edge systems, the way we have done it in all of our sample code is uh, this way. So we define a method, and then we create a metric here, give it a name. There's no units for, no SI units for uh, uh, percent and uh, give it an interval, 10 seconds, and an aggregation size of two, meaning execute this UDM every 10 seconds. When you collect two samples, flow those samples uh, to the registered data component, data center component. And that UDM can go out and do anything it wants to do. 
can be blocking or polling. It could access a dozen different devices, get values from each, do some computation on those, return a single value. It's really up to the UDM. It's just code at that point. Uh, the only restriction is that it either returns a, a scalar, a single number, or a list of tuples of timestamp value. So now I just wanted to walk through uh, the repo a bit and take a look at uh, some of the some of the examples we have there. So this is just a convenience uh, to get some of the values out of config files for our customers. So here's the, here's the UDMs we're going to use in this example, CPU processes, utilization, disk usage, networking bytes, memory free. So we used to be called IoT Control Center. We're now called Project ICE. We were known as Helix at one time, and Rialto is another, and we will have another official name when we beta. Uh, later this year, so Project ICE for now. We're also known as Control Center. We got tired of changing the name and the code, so we're just sticking with this now. Uh, here we're creating a, an edge system. So the, the instance type is Dell 5K edge system. Uh, we get that uh, back. We register it with um, IOTCC. Set some properties on it from the properties list. Uh, properties in this case are key value store, arbitrary key value store for this. Uh, here's where we created that metric. Register that metric with the data center side. Uh, this, is, this is optional, but we create a, rep, uh, create a relationship between uh, the metric and the gateway because uh, that's what this metric talks about, is, is the gateway. And then we start collecting. And we'll go over how these are collected. We do the same thing for the other metrics. Here's a simulated device. So we're using RAM as a device, but we could just as well have used a thermistor attached to this or some sort of network connected device. Basically go through the same process, create the, the entity, register it, create a relationship, create a met metric on it, do that, start collecting the metric. So I want to show you a example from Package Manager now. So we... Uh, and my intern, one of my interns this summer, I said, hey, there's these SI units thing. We'd really like uh, to have them useful in the code. I don't know if you know SI units or anybody know Pint, the realization of that in Python. So he said, so, okay, so what, kind of, what am I going to use it for? I said, so first write a simulation of a stationary bike so it, it can produce some like numbers in physics and then use... Uh, do some physics calculation on them using units. Make sure you don't get anything wrong. Produce a value. So he did that. Uh, here's where you check units to make sure that uh, the, the thing you're doing is correct. So he, he does uh, a bunch of his uh, uh, UDMs here. Here's his get the power from the bike. So he's computing with uh, units. And here's the beginning of the, the, uh, the run method for this package. Does he have a dependency list up here? Uh, I don't think he did. OK. But in the run method, then, uh, uh, this is how he creates the metrics and pushes them out to the graphite uh, 
uh, open source time series graphing tool. Okay. So now I wanted to, uh, to go over sort of the metric handling. And once you create a metric, uh, create its metadata, register with the data center, uh, and start collecting what happens to it. So we have three queues, uh, an event queue, uh, collection queue, and a send queue. Uh, once a metric is, you start collecting it, we look at the next uh, absolute time that this metric should be collected or the next collection time and put it in the event queue. The ed en event queue is sorted by uh, priority with the next uh, ready event uh, at the front of the queue. When the event thread wakes up, it looks at the front of the queue and says, are any of these metrics ready to collect? Yes grabs them, throws them into the collect queue, and keeps doing that until uh, the, the one at the head of the queue isn't ready to collect, and it goes to sleep until the next time it should look. Those in the collect queue get grabbed by a, a uh, collection thread. So there's a thread pool. They're assigned to a metric. And then the UDM is executed. And the UDM can be polling or event. So the UDM could go sit and block on a communication endpoint and wait for something to show up there. It's perfectly fine. Or if you know if you're accessing a device, if you're accessing some sort of a register and there's always a value in there, the UDM can return immediately with that. So a polling kind of mechanism. The, um, at the end of that, if the... Uh, if, the, uh, if you've accumulated enough uh, values, then that metric, a clone of that metric, gets sent to the send thread to be sent uh, to the data center component. And, if, uh, and, and then the original one goes back into the event queue at the proper place for its next collection cycle. And uh, then in the send thread, it gets sent uh, to the data center component to which it was registered. And there's just a little simulation to, to walk us through this. So there's, this is a single metric in the event queue. Its next collection time is 5, and we're at time 0. So at time 5, it moves to the collect queue. Uh, its aggregation size is 1. So when it gets collected by the collect thread, its clone is going to go to the send queue. and uh, it'll go back in to be collected at, at uh, time 10. So a complex case of two of them in there, 5 and 8. Same thing happens with 5. But now its aggregation count was 2, so it goes back to the party queue or the events queue. We, we don't do that at time 8 because... 8 will go through that round, get collected, and go to 16 at time equal 10. This one goes through, gets sent, and now we're at 15 and 16 in the event queue. So back to this. Uh, you can do this. You can use Leota for open end-to-end uh, -end using open source stuff. Uh, we're happy to have that happen. Uh, one, of the, the, one of the problems yesterday at the hackathon was to write a data center component for Bluemix. And one of the people there said, I don't like Bluemix because it's from IBM, so I'm going to do my own. So he did a DCC for Pickwick, which is a, kind of a, a web statistics tool. But you can, and he did it in about three hours. And so now we can use Leota completely to send time series data uh, to Pickwick. And of course, you can use it uh, for sending to any of those. We have now Bluemix. Uh, DCC's AWS thing works. People I know are working on one for Azure. 
and so that's possible as well. As I mentioned earlier, we did, we did the hackathon yesterday with Cosima, our ABB Yumi robot. And uh, the, it, the, the simulation environment is still up. So if you're interested, you can go to that URL, get the uh, syllabus, detailed instructions, how to install and, and work with uh, Leota and see it come up in, in ICE. And let, if you know, let, let us know and we'll give you the login creds for one of these Ubuntu VMs and you can go play around with it. And if, if you're interested, uh, that's the hashtags that our marketing people are anxiously watching for. Uh, so do us a favor and tweet with those, even if you just tweet with those and say, I didn't like it, because they don't read the tweets, they just count them. Uh, and if you're interested, there's a survey if you uh, want to do that. So any questions now? I think we're about out of time. But maybe a few questions. No? Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>